Nice. Um, Corey, would you mind maybe running a power his PowerPoint? Oh, there we go. I got it now. Sorry about that. I lost. Just let me know when you can see the full screen. Perfect. Got it. Yes, that looks great. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I apologize. My partner, Kirk Thompson, was supposed to give this talk. Unfortunately, had a, uh, a complication that he had to attend to. Uh, so I'm kind of filling in for him. Uh, I will do my best. I know he would have uh, given a, a better talk here, but uh, I'll struggle through it. If anybody has any questions, feel free to stop me. Uh, I'm really worried to talk about uh, managing complications as a, a young surgeon. And for this talk, we don't have any um, disclosures. I do want to thank our attorney, Jeff Woods, uh, as well as SVMIC team uh, for their uh, help with this talk as well. And for the talk, I really want to talk about as a young surgeon, uh, recognizing your complications, uh, understanding what happened, and then uh, going through some strategies to minimize the complications, uh, both preoperatively uh, planning for and uh, intraoperatively avoiding as well as uh, success successfully managing op uh, complications uh, postoperatively when they do occur. And unfortunately, uh, if, you, if you operate, you are gonna have complications. Everyone does uh, big, small, and everywhere in between, uh, but it's really how you uh, try to avoid them and how you deal with them afterwards that uh, really makes the biggest difference. So a uh, small case here, 75-year-old uh, female, four months of uh, leg pain, L4 distribution, uh, she's failed conservative uh, treatments. Um, uh, unfortunately, this is also the uh, family member of a senior partner. Um, so this is her MRI, large disc herniation. She went through microdiscectomy, uh, did great, no complications intraoperatively, came back two weeks, had zero pain, uh, uh, good strength, uh, incision benign. And then at four weeks, came back again and called and said that uh, she had excruciating leg pain. Uh, the wound was draining. Uh, he ordered an MRI at that point, which did show a disc herniation. She was taking the OR that night for re uh, revision uh, discectomy, as well as debridement. During the revision discectomy, there was a durotomy uh, that was repaired primarily, uh, watertight, no problems with that. Uh, but the wound, however, did uh, come back positive for pseudomonas. Uh, so she was treated for six weeks with IV antibiotics. Uh, two weeks following that revision case, she came back to the office once again with a draining wound uh, that looked somewhat concerning, uh, taken back again to the OR for another repeat debridement, uh, uh, which again was uncomplicated. Uh, and then finally, two weeks following that, uh, she did heal the wound, uh, was doing better, but by that point was about two months out, uh, had really gone through quite a bit, was deconditioned. And it was really about a year after the index procedure before she was really back to her baseline and no longer on uh, narcotics. Um, so the, the first uh, part of uh, dealing with complications is trying to avoid them. And the, the biggest thing we can do to help ourselves with that is optimizing patients and also selecting the patient uh, for the, the procedure. Uh, so we all know smoking, diabetes, obesity, uh, immunosuppression, osteoporosis, all have significant risk that they add to a lot of the surgeries we do. Um, so I know most people, uh, I hope everyone has some sort of system in place preoperatively that they evaluate patients for, and really making sure that you have a system as far as if somebody does smoke to be able to get them uh, off of uh, cigarettes, uh, really for a, a month prior to a surgery is best, but really as, I mean, if it's a surgery that needs to be done, even if they stop the day of, it's still better than continuing to smoke. Uh, A1C for diabetics, uh, Dr. Thompson uses eight. Uh, I really try to get under seven, uh, seven, five, I will do for some things, but again, uh, having a number in mind and uh, trying to stick to it is better than uh, just not even looking into it. Uh, and certainly obesity, uh, as the distance between the skin and the spine increases, uh, so does your uh, infection rate uh, quite drastically uh, as, the, as that distance does increase. Um, and then for osteoporosis, either getting a DEXA preoperatively, or a, a lot of people I know use a CT with uh, Hounsfield units. But again, as long as you have a system, you look into it and uh, you, you keep true to it, 
then uh, you can really decrease your uh, complication rate pretty drastically. Okay, so, uh, and then intraoperatively, uh, what can we do to prevent and avoid our complications? Uh, and it's really dependent on the, the surgery. Uh, for surgical, uh, cervical surgeries, certainly hematoma, dysphagia are uh, some of the highest risks that we have, but also uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, even durotomy uh, and neurologic injuries. And again, a lot of it goes into your preoperative planning, knowing where the vertebral arteries are. Um, again, smoking for uh, esophageal injury and dysphagia certainly increases uh, risk. Um, and then surg your surgical technique uh, adds quite a bit as well. Uh, a lot of times uh, deflating the cuff, uh, reducing your retractor time can significantly reduce some of the soft tissue uh, injuries that we iatrogenically do create. Uh, and then for lumbar, uh, and that this was kind of, kind of uh, staggering to me, 50% over career have a wrong site surgery um, with a wrong level. Thigh pain, 50%, again, for uh, lateral surgery. Uh, these are uh, fairly high numbers. Uh, and again, if you operate, you will have complications. And a lot of it goes into your preoperative planning, optimization, and then just meticulous uh, uh, technique during a, a surgery to try to avoid a lot of these issues and uh, certainly taking your time, uh, not rushing through with some of these uh, higher risk um, portions of the procedure can really reduce your risk as well. Uh, in an ambulatory surgery center, I'm not sure how many people uh, perform spine surgeries in ASC or not. Uh, both Dr. Thompson and myself do. Um, but again, uh, preoperatively deciding what, which procedures are we feel comfortable doing there and certainly which patients uh, adds uh, a lot to uh, your preoperative workup and discussing with anesthesia, but certainly avoiding uh, uh, some complications that can occur and uh, it caused some issues for the surgery center as well is, is certainly a big part of it. Um, and a lot of it is preoperatively talking with the patient and getting them on board to understand what exactly happens the day of surgery. When they go home, what do they need to look out for? And if something does concern them or uh, they have an issue, who do they call, uh, whether it's after hours or um, a weekend? Um, I know at our surgery centers for say, uh, for ACDS, we keep them for four to six hours afterwards and monitor people. Uh, and then that night I usually call patients and say, uh, Hey, how are you doing? Um, is the wound? Okay. Your neck swollen, you're swallowing. Okay. But really giving them a, an outlet if they have any issues whatsoever that they can always call. Uh, and that seems to really make people more comfortable, uh, with, a, an ambulatory surgery, whether in a, a, an ASC or even as an outpatient in the hospital. Um, and along with the pre-op discussion, you're informed to consent to telling somebody uh, what their diagnosis is. It's amazing how many people go into a surgery and don't know what, why they're having the surgery. They, they know certainly what their pain is, but they don't know why, the, why they have this, the pain or what the surgery is going to be to alleviate that pain. Uh, and then talking about with them, what are the risks of that surgery particularly, uh, as well as the anesthetic ri risks. And if those things do occur, what, what, what happens then? Uh, certainly setting that stage on the on the front end of things it makes the, the the backside easier even as even though it's never an easy conversation to have with somebody as long as they know going into it they have some idea in their mind uh, it certainly makes their understanding and uh, getting through the conversation a lot easier um, so we did talk to uh, some of the as i said an attorney and our svmic uh, which is our malpractice insurance about some uh, things that they may have to offer. And really uh, when a complication does occur, what, what do they recommend? And really, I mean, obviously the first thing is take care of the patient, right? Do the right thing for the patient uh, no matter what. And uh, that's the biggest thing. And then once you are done with the procedure, really gather your thoughts, get all the facts together you need. Um, certainly if something, uh, an instrument failure occurred, uh, anything that you need to uh, keep track of uh, for whatever reason after the case, make sure you have all that together. And then I think the really big thing is sit down with yourself, go through what happened, talk, uh, kind of talk with the people around you and figure out what, what made the patient and the family want to know and get an idea in your head what you're going to say and, and what they may ask. And again, that makes the conversation a little bit easier on the back end. Uh, and again, they're never good conversations to have, but certainly 
if you're able to go into it with, with an idea of how you're going to get through it, it makes it easier for you. And as well as it makes it easier for the patient and the family that you uh, at least seem to know what's going on and have an idea of, of what needs to be done. Uh, also, they recommend a, a witness sometimes is not a bad uh, person to bring with you just to, I mean, offer support to you and the patient, uh, as well as if the conversation does go sideways, having somebody around just as a witness is, is never a bad idea. Um, so I'm sorry laws. I, I do remember in medical school, I, I swear they told us never say I'm sorry if you have a complication. Uh, and I never quite understood that. Uh, I know in Tennessee here, we do have uh, I'm sorry laws, which is basically you expressing uh, not even forgiveness, forgiveness, but uh, just saying that you are sorry something happened or that that's not necessarily you're admitting guilt here in Tennessee. Uh, and a lot of states have similar laws where uh, you expressing concern and uh, uh, sorrow for, for a, a bad outcome does not uh, mean that they can use that in court. It's inadmissible uh, in court. Um, and 40 states have it. Uh, again, you may want to check with your uh, practice in your state if they do or not. Um, but it, it certainly makes sense to me that uh, being a human and telling somebody you're sorry for something to happen uh, really is, is probably better uh, than not. Um, so once you do have an intraoperative complication, again, we kind of talked about you, you got to find somewhere to sit down with the family, tell them exactly what happened. When the patient's awake, you, you need to make sure that they're aware of what happened, um, but also what, what happens now? What, what are the steps we need to take to either rectify the situation or uh, to help um, the patient recover from whatever happened? Um, and certainly documenting uh, both in the chart, uh, but also just a, a personal doc document for yourself of the facts of what, how you remember them. Um, uh, even writing in a little notebook is, can certainly be helpful. You're never going to remember things as well as you do, certainly right after uh, anything happens. Uh, so it's certainly sitting down and uh, recording your thoughts uh, is always important. But again, documentation, and documentation in the chart is uh, certainly uh, necessary as well. Um, all, all hospitals have risk management. Uh, and I would certainly recommend if there's a, a serious complication, maybe just letting them know, hey, this happened. Uh, is there anything we need to do on our end as far as further documentation uh, or anything that needs to be looked into to prevent any uh, uh, future happenings uh, that, are, that are similar to that? Um, but again, with the patient, you need to tell them exactly what happened and what you're going to do uh, to help them, but also just being there and making sure they know that you're, you're not uh, just abandoning them. That's the number one reason uh, patients uh, tend to get, pursue litigation is that they feel abandoned by the physician. And it's certainly easy to, if you have a complication, not want to uh, face it and uh, see the patient uh, once, twice, three times a day, because it, it, it's, it's hurtful to you as well. But again, the, as long as they understand that you are with them, you're not going to uh, just uh, abandon them. It certainly makes the patient uh, more comfortable and less likely to uh, pursue litigation. Um, and then there, there's always a, a secondary victim in this. Yes, the patient gets hurt. The family gets hurt. Uh, everyone associated with this gets hurt, including the provider. And, and that is why it's, it's uh, in your best interest to certainly talk about it, not avoid it. Talk about it with partners, uh, friends, uh, colleagues of any kind but certainly talking about it and not hiding from it can be helpful. Um, and again, you, you just wanna make sure you're, you're facing things up front and, and not making sure that, that um, you, you do acknowledge what happened uh, you have to move past it. But uh, a complication not only becomes a complication for one patient, but can linger and unfortunately have consequence, consequences for, for other surgeries and patients. Um, so uh, again, I'm sorry that this is uh, me struggling through this, but uh, Dr. Thompson would have been here if he could, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions as, as best as I can if anybody has any. Great job, Chad. I think that you definitely highlighted on a lot of things that as young surgeons that we always think about, but then once you're in it, you you realize that you don't understand or know resources. Um, I think... I have this question for both you and Jim. 
But what do you think is a good way to combat that imposter syndrome when you do get it, when you think that you're doing the right thing or that you're not worthy after a, a decent complication or even just being a young surgeon, I think it's really difficult to, to believe in yourself at, in these points where it's, you know, not a good day and there's a bad complication you have to deal with it, but then, you know, you feel less than how do you guys combat imposter syndrome in that sense? I mean, uh, I think Kat, you and I had talked about this at some point, but things like this, where you hear other people who have the same exact complications as you do and feel the same way about them. And uh, I think that was the biggest help that I've uh, had when I've had a complication, talking to a partner, a friend, um, even just going to meetings and you hear people talk about having the same problems that you've had. It, then you realize that you're not the only one. And I get, for people that don't know what the imposter syndrome is, I had to look it up. It's basically, you feel like you're not good enough to uh, do something that basically you're pretending almost you're pretending to be a spine surgeon. You're not really a spine surgeon. Um, and I mean, I've certainly had times where I uh, felt that way uh, to a degree and then talking to someone um, and hearing that they've gone through the same exact thing that, yeah, I mean, unfortunately all spine surgeons have complications um, and then just keeping people around to talk to and uh, certainly scrub with if need be uh, can definitely be helpful. Yeah, I think it's a great question, Kat. And I think just a second, Chad, uh, anytime something doesn't go the way you want it to, first thing I do is, you know, after talking to the patient, you have that moment to yourself. I find, you know, whoever you trust the most, and whether that's a spouse, a loved one, but also a mentor, you know, pick someone that you really trust and say, hey, X, Y, and Z happened. And then almost always, every time I've talked with one of my mentors, they're like, oh, yeah, well, you know, I had X, Y, and Z happen, and I had this. And you understand that, you know, not only are they still standing, you know, they're, they're teaching future surgeons like ourselves. And so, you know, I think that's the number one thing. And the only other thing I would add is, you know, you got to get back on the horse, you know, find the next procedure, find the next thing. I, I don't care if it's just driving home or just do the next thing, accomplish another task. And, you know, ultimately the best thing I find is that going to the next surgery and not letting that complicate you and say, all right, I got through this, I can get through the next one. And then you just keep working along, uh, I think makes a huge difference for this. I agree with both of what you said. I guess I'm more in tune with imposter syndrome because they kind of highlighted as buzzwordies for females and we tend to kind of get pigeonholed into that. But I do think for the, for the panel, um, you know, I know Dr. Chapman's on here, maybe he can speak to that as well. Being a young surgeon, you know, just like Chad said, you're not alone. We're all here together. Um, so if no one has any questions, I didn't mention um, this before we started, but I'm going to mention it now. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will address them. Dr. Chapman, do you have anything to buzz into? Yeah, thank you. Great topic. Congratulations on having this contentious subject right out of the shoot. Um, two things. First of all, a question. Should patients be owner of the surgery center? I found this a recent thing. I was asked about that in a legally contentious case. And um, a patient claims they had no idea and that they felt duped into doing this. I'm just throwing this out there for the group. Um, before I have you uh, guys discuss this briefly, maybe, uh, the one thing I wanna emphasize is this don't walk alone. Um, we are also victims in this and uh, I've certainly had my complications. And the lawyers will tell you, you can't talk to anybody except for your spouse. The so-called spousal privilege is real, but um, this is probably the worst advice given because it isolates you and it uh, sets you up for negative thought cycles. So uh, this is a very extensive topic, but uh, and I talked to our fellows about this very specifically. Um, it is entirely possible to talk about the experiences
talk about complications to colleagues. In fact, I encourage it. So my one of my We lose Dr. Chapman. I do think we did lose Dr. Chapman, but we do have a um, question in the chat box on any advice on balancing trying for a perfect case versus the enemy of good is better or fixing a complication, knowing when all you've done um, that you can. I, I think that for this person, I'll start is that I am always on myself as the enemy of good. Um, I want things to be perfect to almost a fault. And I think that as a new young surgeon that I actually started timing myself a little bit. Oh, Dr. Chapman, you're back in. Um, we had a question about balancing for a perfect case versus the enemy of good. Um, <laughs> and we were just discussing that, but if you want to continue on what you were saying, and then we can go back to this question. I know we, we lost you for a second. I'm sorry that I cut out. Uh, so the, the main thing that I want to say is uh, while you want to keep the anonymity of your case intact, discussing complications in principle as part of peer review uh, without using patient identifiers is a clear road towards uh, uh, feeling better. And um, so you just have to be smart about that. And if attorneys ask you, have you talked to anybody about this case, you can say no um, in truthfulness. Um, so you don't want to drag a million other people in there, but close friends are absolutely valuable. And again, use peer review, which is actually encouraged by the medical legal uh, community to your advantage. Uh, just don't use patient identifiers and you're fine. Thank you for that. I, I probably wouldn't have known that. I have heard that spousal rule, um, but my spouse is not interested in spine surgery. So I don't know. <laughs> he, he just kind of tells me, good job, babe. But um, we'll go back to the question that we got in the chat box on the enemy of good. Um, and I'm not really sure if this is, it's not an inappropriate way to say it, but what I've started to do is I've asked, I've started to ask my team who's not scrubbed in to time me when I think that I am futzing or trying to make something better to the point of perfection. And what it does is that I, sets off my external clock to tell my internal clock. I think that you have reached your point of that you're doing harm to the patient more than you're actually benefiting them. And there's been multiple times that I've had a complication where I've changed course based off of my intraoperative findings and my complication, which ultimately I think is, you know, still an acceptable thing to do. It's a clinical gestalt. Um, but the betterment of good is real. And we're young surgeons who tend to operate longer and our patients tend to be asleep longer. And so you need to understand the balance. Yeah, I've, uh, I've yet to achieve a perfect case. Uh, I, I don't know what those are. I, I fortunately uh, try to just do the best I can. And, you know, perfection is what we aspire to, as you said, Kat. But, you know, in my mind, I think, you know, uh, did I accomplish the goal I could? And that's plan A. Plan B is, can I get done what needs to get done safely? And then plan C is, can I finish this case safely and figure out another way to take care of this problem in the future? And how can I do that? And so all of that's going in your mind while you're going through the case. In each case, you should really have an A, B, and C in mind and think about what the worst possible thing that can happen to your patient and go from there. And so I think it's really you know, it's all about preparation. So every single case of mine, I have a PowerPoint and I have a plan. I literally write plan A on the PowerPoint, plan B and plan C. And, uh, you know, people joke in my OR how pessimistic I am, but I think it, uh, it helps to have that. And then also for the people you're working with to see that, because then they'll think to themselves, all right, well, you know, Jim's three and a half hours in still fixing the serotomy and you know, maybe we're heading B ways and uh, they have an idea what's going on. And I would just say, I, I always think to myself, I mean, if you, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about fixing an ugly screw, but the screw is safe. My, my first thing is, is the patient safe? Are they going to have any worse outcome if I leave this versus if I change something? Uh, and if the answer is ever the patient's outcome is going to be affected by something, then without doubt, change it. If, if it is, well, it just would look better on an x-ray or something along those lines, 
then it, there really, I really need a reason to change something. Um, but really patient safety and outcome, I think is the first thing that I would look to, uh, to answer that question. And Dr. Davis uh, made a good uh, note for ambulance in the chat uh, to get a consult or a note in the chart from a, either a mentor or a senior partner. Um, that's, that's certainly a good idea as well after a complication. I want to say, can I say something about um, the speed of surgeries? So, so one of my biggest pet peeves, and I've helped multiple of our former fellows with this, is having some proctor surgeon at your new location tell you that they can do a discectomy in half an hour. My practice is full of patients who've been victimized with the magnificent half hour surgeons. And so uh, I would never, ever be blighted by that. But I do think it's a good idea that you compartmentalize surgeries into different stages, like how long does it take me to do a one level or two level exposure? How long does it take me to do a decompression? And time yourself and develop your own little average portfolio since you're realistic as your time estimates. And as long as you post it properly and you do the right job, um, it'll be just fine. And um, the the best paradigm for me is always the SEALs motto of uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And I cannot overemphasize that. You just do your stuff steadily, ready, uh, with a clean um, uh, feeling, and you move forward, you monitor your progress, and you'll be fine. You'll be amazed how fast it is, and a happy patient is always. Perfect. Thank you. We've also got another um, comment in the chat box from Dr. Fravert saying that, you know, kind of like Jim was highlighting, you know, calibrate your medical decisions based off of the quality of the patient that you're operating on. Is it a really sick patient that even though, you know, like Chad is saying, the screw is not going to hurt anybody and getting off the table may be more important, um, you know, if they're sicker and then the younger, healthier patient you know, make a clinical decision. And I think that we're just young. And so that it's kind of hard to make clinical decisions when you haven't had to by yourself. And we look for that badge of courage that is on our shoulder from our white coats when we were trainees. And it is def definitely difficult. I think for the sake of time, what we'll do is we'll now pivot into case presentations, which are all complication related. And um, that will help us kind of foster more of this discussion. Please again, put any questions you have in the chat box. So case one is a 56 year old male who had presented to the emergency room. Um, very uniquely, he said a 700 pound glass plane fell onto his back. He had, you know, pretty abrupt, um, pain and was not able to ambulate. He works in a factory and he does drink quote considerably, but otherwise was relatively healthy. Um, and he also had an acetabular fracture dislocation corresponding. Um, but he was neuro motor sensory intact distally. And he presented with this fracture, um, which these are isolated CT scans. I'm sorry, I can't scroll through it, but what you can see is that he had a complete fracture dislocation at L45, which this is the first time I think I've ever seen that. It's not traditionally a fracture dislocation level. You can see his facets are unroofed here and that he's dislocated L4 on L5 and he has this shear type fracture pattern. Um, and here's his dislocated facet here and you can see there's an empty facet sign here. So we're traditionally looking for empty facet signs in the cervical spine. And I remember when my second year called me and told me that they had a fracture dislocation at L4-5, I said, you mean C4-5? And he laughed at me. And then I looked at the imaging. Um, so the patient's motor sensory and intact. He also has a sassitabular fracture. Um, what we ended up uh, approaching this, and since we're kind of discussing things as we go, how would we approach this? Obviously you would want to get it reduced and stabilized. And so that's exactly what we did. We took him back and did a rather large um, fusion construct for 56 year old, but we did it based on the appropriateness of the, of the injury. Um, at this institution, we don't no notoriously get MRIs, um, but he had complete disruption of his entire posterior ligamentous complex from about the top of L4 down to the sacrum. And so that was the, the, I thought also that, you know, this is an extensive 
type of injury. This is high energy, 700 pounds onto a human. And I don't think I've ever seen a lumbar fracture dislocation, not saying that means anything, but you know, it's a rather perfunctory statement. Um, this is his post-op exam and we had to do a full facetectomy to get him reduced, um, and do, um, some maneuvering. These are unilateral, um, or uniaxial screws. So they have a lot more, um, I guess it's a lot easier to reduce it. It's the old fracture system. It's the USS system. So it has a lot more ability to reduce a rod to the patient's, um, fracture and manipulate their fracture through their screws, but it was gentle distraction and some pushing and pulling and as well as bilateral facetectomies. The patient then presented, um, these are his post-op exam, um, x-rays, nothing, you know, too out of the ordinary. He went to rehab after he was fixed, um, also for his acetabular, um, fracture. He was discharged home at four weeks. And then, um, I just got a question from Dr. Chapman. He did have an extensive morel more, uh, his soft tissue was, was completely disrupted and we work, um, very careful that our closure was pretty meticulous. Cause I was worried he was going to be infected, um, because the 700 pound piece of glass that shoved into him pretty much sheared off all of the muscles from the thoracolumbar spine and then down into his right uh, gluteal region. I think that I was told that he completely avulsed his piriformis and um, his medius tendons. And so, you know, he, he definitely had a large uh, mechanism, which puts him at risk for a morel of all lesion. And so we were pretty tedious on that. Thankfully that's not the complication, um, but it could have been. He returned to the ED eight weeks um, after uh, presenting in clinic with a normal post-op exam, complaining of increased back pain and a right lower extremity foot drop. And unfortunately had an acute fracture of his hardware as well as a re, um, what I'll just say is subluxation, but obviously I would just say dislocation of his L4 on five um, previous injury. And you can see that sheer fracture at the L5 level was still obviously a, a component that was not as well recognized. I mean, these are six O titanium rods with, you know, six, five, seven, five screws. These are, these are large puppies. This wasn't something, but obviously the mechanism was one that we under recognized the veracity of the injury and that maybe a six millimeter rod was probably, you know, not adequate. So now what we, you know, evaluated him. He had a foot drop. We, um, urgently took him back to the OR to re-reduce his fracture. And then we ended up doing quad rod fixation. I think that I would have even argued for, this is, um, a little bit ago. I probably would have even argued for going to the ilium in this case. I think that that's also a good utilization for extra strength and construct. Um, but I think that our ultimate fault was that we didn't really have anterior column support with the shear fracture at L5 and that we had to do he had fractured one of his facets, but then we had to do a complete facetectomy on the other side in order to adequately reduce him at the index procedure. And so those were the two main resultants of this complication. Ultimately, his foot drop improved and he had a normal postoperative course afterwards with no residual deficits and um, he healed just fine. But this is a complication related to hardware failure in a pretty acute sense. I'd be um, curious to see if Jim or Chad, you would have changed your thought, maybe come from the front even, or or tried a different approach uh, the index procedure to maybe in hindsight prevent this from, you know, happening. No, I agree with what you said. Maybe going to the ilium. I I don't know that I would have necessarily jumped on going to the front, especially with the vertebral body fracture at five. I mean, yeah, you could put something in there, but um, I don't know that I would have done much different. I know you said this is a big construct for somebody that has a four or five fracture dislocation going two above and two below to me is not a big construct. I, th I think you uh, did about this. Yeah, and maybe that's why the, the, that's maybe why, you know, we did a short, a short segment fusion. Maybe that is why, you know, he, he ultimately did fail. Maybe going two to the pelvis would have 
would have given him a longer working length and that, you know, it put too much stress on the skirt, on the rod. So I, I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to say either way. Um, I, I can't say that I've dealt with, uh, this particular injury, but, um, I, I don't think what you did was wrong, but yeah, I don't think going to the pelvis would have been a bad thing. Um, but uh, I don't think three above, uh, to the pelvis is bad either, but yeah, it's, it, again, I, I don't take care of these anymore. Thank God. So, <laughs> well, I, I think I imparted on myself that if I see a lumbar fracture dislocation, that I'm going to be quite more aggressive. Jim, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think, sure. Maybe the, uh, degree of energy that this trauma was necessitated maybe a little bit more from a level standpoint, but I would not have ventured into the uh, intervertebral disc space because those type of teardrops, I mean, you could have uh, uh, an inner body there. If you say you play something there and then it seared off, you'd be, uh, I think you'd be in uh, uh, tough sledding there trying to adjust that because I think that would have plowed right into the cancellous bone of, of five. And I think you'd be uh, now with a major kind of revision there and uh, maybe you do it at a different time, but yeah, I, I don't disagree with what you, what you did, but I mean, how many times do people have 700 pound glass panels uh, break their back in half? So, uh, you know, hindsight's 2020, 20, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't think I would have chased anything in the anterior column acutely at least. Yeah. Dr. Chapman did reference that you could even just maybe put in a buttress, you know, a lift on the index procedure. And, you know, they do have those pretty old school synthes, like robust plates that you can put on the front. I think we're getting to in the minutia on this, but I think that this is one that did definitely showed me not to underestimate the extent of the injury, like everyone is highlighting. Um, and that maybe going long and going wide is, is not as bad of a, you know, beef up your, your, um, hardware is probably not the wrong answer in these. I think for the people watching, I would just, you know, likely, luckily impart some, a little bit of, Hey, if you ever see this, don't, you know, underestimate it. Cause I definitely did. Luckily the gentleman, um, didn't have too bad of a post-operative course following this. And so I think we got lucky. Um, but it's one of those things where I think that, you know, if when we have a little bit more gray hair behind us, we'll, we'll definitely share stories of these um, and learn from them as we go. I'll drive for you guys. So I don't know which one's next, but I'll keep going. Yeah, yeah this is me. Um, so uh, this is an uh, interesting complication because it's uh, one that I've never encountered ever in training. And of course, it happens in your first year of uh, being an attending. So a uh, 62-year-old woman, morbidly obese, uh, pure, basically myopathic symptoms. Um, it's been going on for about six months. You know, I saw her uh, two months uh, into the symptoms uh, and our workup. I uh, kind of explained to her, I, you know, I think this should be something that you take care of sooner rather than later. She wanted to go down to Florida and then came back for the uh, procedure four months later with worsening symptoms, as noted here. Um, I think there are a couple of important factors that I uh, bolded, you know, having the myopathic findings on physical examination. Um, she was an active smoker and had a prior partial thyroidectomy. Next slide. So your x-rays, um, you know, you see some uh, no significant chronal plane deformity, some subaxial cervical spondylosis, maintenance of kind of overall lordosis. Um, next slide. Like an extension, you know, I don't see any significant instability with these findings. Uh, maybe a little bit of congenital cervical stenosis, but hard to say. So we got the MRI. Next slide. So she's got multi-level uh, cervical spondylosis and kind of stenosis at multiple levels. I don't know if I did each level, but you can kind of, uh, I think if you go through the next slide, I think we go to each disc space. So, you know, and next slide. Basically, you've got pure myopathic symptoms with a uh, um, a uh, woman who's a smoker and prior anterior neck procedure, you know, how are you going to proceed? So I do think that she's an operative candidate. And I do think that perhaps some of the signal in the cord may be real. And I was fairly concerned, even though it's not the optimal surgical candidate, consider operative intervention. Next slide. And that's just the bottom line. So yeah, we go through the treatment options and in uh, interest of time, you know, you can think of it multi-level fusion from the front, 
from the back or laminoplasty. I went to Emory, so I chose door number three. Next slide. So here are the x-rays at the initial picture. Those are the uh, positioning and imaging. Next slide. And the hardware comes in about three and a half hours later. We had an EBL of about 500 cc's. It was a bloody mess in there for quite some time. We got the eight pictures in another. Next slide. So we get that picture. And then, you know, I think the plates are okay. Everything's kind of reasonably positioned. I get an AP view just to make sure, double check on levels. And then I see that thing to the uh, side opposite of the plate. And I'm thinking, what the hell is going on here? And so, you know, we're, you know, four hours into this case, positions, motors were fine. You know, we didn't get any kind of warning from anesthesia. And then you think to yourself, yeah, and that, that's picking and pointing out here. And I, I think to myself, all right, and go to the next slide. I go back to that first picture and I say, well, wait a second. That was there. Uh, and I don't see any plates there. So first thing I did was check all of my imaging. And the patient's doing fine. You know, we're finishing up the case. We're getting these pictures. And I'm, I'm saying, well, that's in front of something. And on the AP view, I see it. So I think something's going on here. And so when you're worried, you look up. And so <laughs> I see a couple other similarly shaped radio opaque densities in that area here. And I see the endotracheal tube. So the first thing I did, uh, well, actually go to the next slide. I don't know. Let me just see if it was through that. Okay. Yeah. So I'm thinking to myself, we got probably a temporary tooth here. This, uh, this patient also, um, we had to remove a nose ring prior to the beginning of the procedure, so I should have known. Um, but anyway, so here we are. I've got this radio opaque thing in some part of the anterior soft tissues of the neck. Um, and so I'm thinking to myself, well, it's been there the whole case. You know, the patient's relatively stable. But the first thing I do is call in the anesthesiologist who comes in. They had changed the anesthesiologist during the case because the case took a long time. Um, and... I basically said, you know, the patient's stable. What do you think we should do? So go to the next slide. So, you know, we come up with a plan, you know, uh, that we were very fortunate because the patient's stable and we're thinking, you know, this is in and around the endotracheal tube. So I'm thinking if, if there hasn't been any change in her overall respiration, her SATs had been fine the whole case, you know, we should finish the case. Um, and so they decided to do a laryng laryngoscopy and uh, they found the trial tooth in the molecular right above the ET tube. So uh, she was extubated, no significant dysphagia or dysphonia post-op. Um, I chatted with the patient and she kind of laughed at me and said, oh, I've had this happen to me before uh, when I had a prior procedure for my thyroidectomy and almost an identical thing occurred. Uh, but I did chat with her. You know, I explained we found this. I And I, I tried to explain to her, I found this kind of towards the end of the case and we evaluated it and you were safe the entire time, but um, this is what was going on. And uh, she uh, did fortunately reasonably well. And, uh, but it, what it taught me is that, you know, whenever you take a picture in the OR, look at the entire picture. All I was focusing on is the positioning of the neck and I want to scrub in and get this over with and, and, you know, help this lady out. And so, you know, you get this tunnel vision and you can easily miss something that may be awry. And you always have other things, you know, the neuromonitoring and other type of uh, instruments in your field. So if something looks funky to you, um, you know, take that extra 30 seconds and really evaluate your pictures. So not the, not the most straightforward complication, but something uh, of decent interest to me. I think my husband would be interested in that too. He's a dentist, so he would have been all over it for you. But I mean... Yeah. That's such a good case to bring up, Jim. Thank you so much. We'll we'll go to Chad and then make sure that we have time for questions at the end. All right. So for my case, a uh, 38 year old female, uh, no real past medical histories for a long time, about eight months, uh, some leg pain, and um, she's tried conservative treatments, uh, epidural injections, medicines, uh, the whole deal. You can go to the next slide, Kat. So her x-rays, no instability. She does have a 5.1, uh, some disc space collapse, uh, but really nothing impressive on her x-rays. Next slide. On her MRI, she does have at 5.1, uh, this left-sided disc herniation. Uh, and again, this has been going on for eight months now. Um, next slide. So I took her, uh, so after she's failed of physical therapy and medicines, uh, talked to her about other options. You can go to the next slide. 
and we did a uh, left side of the L5S1 microdiscectomy. Uh, surgery went great. Got a large piece of disc out. Uh, she woke up in the recovery room, said she was feeling great, went home uh, without any problems. I talked to her that night and she said her leg pain was uh, great. No back pain. She was doing awesome. Uh, really happy. Uh, next slide. Uh, th that was a Wednesday. And then the next Monday, my assistant called me saying, Hey, uh, this lady just called me. She's been in the hospital. They're treating her for sepsis and uh, gastritis that she wasn't sure why nobody ever called you, but she's been there for a couple of days and nobody's looked at her back yet. Um, so I finished up for the day, went over to the hospital and uh, saw her. Uh, and really her biggest complaint was my head hurts so bad. It feels like somebody's sucking my brain out. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, the initial note from the hospital, basically, uh, this is from the hospitalist there, uh, H&P, basically saying that she was doing really well uh, for a couple of days postoperatively. Then she started to have this abdominal pain and or constipation, uh, which turned to diarrhea and vomiting. And uh, uh, it was, I think, three or four days post-op. She said she vomited once, stood up, and her head uh, started to kill her. She got dizzy. And uh, since that time, she's either laying down or anytime she stands up, she gets a severe headache and uh, uh, nausea. Uh, and again, you can see she's a couple of days post that her white blood, blood count was uh, 14 with lactate 2.2. Uh, they did get a CAT scan uh, that showed some colitis. Um, you can go to the next slide. And then interesting on the CAT scan, you can also see posteriorly there, uh, there is a fairly large fluid collection. Um, you can go to the next slide. So I talked to her uh, after examining her, she had clear fluid draining out of her wound. Her, her, no, her neuro exam was normal. Uh, but again, anytime she sat up, I mean, this woman looked absolutely miserable. Um, so they were working her up for all different kinds of things and putting her all, on all different kinds of antibiotics. I talked to the hospitalist and said, hey, I think this lady has a dural tear. I'm not sure why it happened three or four days post-op, uh, but her positional headache and this wound drainage of this clear fluid, I'm almost certain that's what it is. I'm gonna put her on the next day for a, uh, a wound exploration. He said, oh yeah, that's probably a good idea. So go to the next slide. Uh, booked her for the wound exploration. Uh, immediately, as soon as I cut the, the skin open, a, a large rush of clear fluid. She did have a longitudinal dural tear that really started underneath the uh, trailing edge of the L5. Um, but I was really thinking I was gonna get in there and find a sharp piece of bone. I didn't. Uh, I did end up taking a little bit more lama just to be able to um, look, uh, just to be able to see the, the dural tear and to be able to repair it. Um, so we did repair it, uh, it was a, a watertight seal, um, postoperatively she woke up and, uh, she immediately said her headache was already better. Um, and then at three months, uh, I saw her actually not that long ago, she's completely pain-free, having no problems whatsoever, uh, no uh, headache at all. Um, I did see somebody asked a question about an MRI. Um, there was an MRI ordered. It had not been done by the time of uh, surgery, and I didn't really think it was going to add very much. Um, so I didn't uh, postpone surgery any further just to, to get the MRI. I figured it was going to show me a fluid collection, uh, and I didn't. Uh, I was fairly certain this was going to be a dural tear. I wouldn't expect an MRI to really add anything. So I didn't wait around for it, but I, I did think about that. And I discussed that with several people and uh, everyone uh, I talked to kind of thought the same thing. So I, I didn't hold off on surgery. Jim, you had a question halfway through. Did you want to ask him? I think you pressed the wrong uh, thing, but I'll uh, ask a question uh, anyway. Um, you know, how much, um, uh, bony work did you do at the exploration? You know, did you have to unroof things, check a couple of places, shatter? Was it kind of just sitting there uh, staring at you? So I, I honestly, I saw the dural uh, tear pretty much as soon as I got in there. It was mostly under the lamina. So I think there probably was some sort of a, a sharp uh, object that when she was bearing down either during diarrhea, vomiting something, uh, she kind of expanded her dura is my best guess and uh, just popped something. I saw Dr. Gradaki uh, mentioned a bleb that wasn't, wasn't visualized intraoperatively. I, I thought about that too. Uh, and I tried to go back to the surgery uh, when I first saw her thinking about if I saw anything weird at all, I don't remember seeing anything. 
but I mean, certainly there could have been uh, just a bleb there that was missed. And then when she bared down that popped, um, but yeah, I mean, there was certainly a dural tear that was not there um, when, when I uh, exited at the index surgery, because it was, it was fairly obvious. Dr. Chapman, you have a comment? I would just want to ask, uh, maybe we have Dr. Fravor, he's a neurosurgeon on board, he's from UT Houston. When should we get a HET CT? When we have a suspicion of a dural tear, obviously we want to fix it, but under what circumstances should we preoperatively get a HET CT to make sure that we are not uh, engendering major problems? Yev, can you un unlock? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Houston Methodist, actually, not UT Houston. Uh, you know, um, in most patients, I don't think a, a head CT is necessary in the context of a, of a dural tear. Uh, really, if you're starting to see a kind of notable alterations in G GCS or focal neurologic deficits, then a stat head CT is, is pretty essential. But if it's just headaches, even if the patient feels like their brain is being sucked out, I, I think just, just repairing, the, repairing the dural tear is probably the way to go. Interesting Dr. enough, this patient had a history of a brain tumor and she thought it was a recurrence. So they did get uh, MRI and CT of her head uh, prior to me even seeing her and they were both normal. Wow. Dr. Fravert, do you believe that the risk of dural tears or um, durotomy causing um, subdurals is higher in elderly patients versus younger patients? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's a lot of evidence to that effect. The um, uh, the uh, amount of uh, brain atrophy in older patients is obviously significantly greater, and that puts more tension on the on the bridging veins uh, between the dura and the brain. Uh, so they're already under uh, under a little bit of threat. And when you have the uh, reduced ICP from uh, from a CSF leak, uh, the chances of tearing one of those veins are much higher. Thank you for uh, heading that up for us. Um, yeah, Chad, I've had one, I think I told you with a laminoplasty, the guy got COVID and started coughing and puking his brains out. And, you know, six days later had an incidental, um, dural tear that was obviously from probably part of our opening. And we, uh, we ultimately actually treated him. He did not want revision surgery. Um, he ultimately got a lumbar drain and then didn't have any problems, but I think that we completely underestimate the Valsalva around new, you know, dural edges and things like that. And I would have never thought of that. One of the things I was uh, trained to do, Chad, is, you know, at the end of the case, when I put the keratins away and swear I'm not going to grab another keratin on your, is ask anesthesia to do a Valsalva maneuver right at the end of the case. And I always document that in my operative report. So at least then we can say, you know, there wasn't any, because, you know, the bleb or something like that, if it's going to pop or if it's friable enough, oftentimes that 40 millimeters of mercury, you know, with direct visualization can be certainly worth documenting at least. Yeah, I've actually started doing that. I can't say I do it every time, but anytime I think about it or there's any kind of struggle at all during it, I, I actually do have them do it um, just because of that, because I, again, don't remember seeing anything funny, but uh, obviously something was there at some point that caused it, so. I agree with Jim, I do the same thing. Um, any of you putting any prophylactic dural, you know, accompaniments on people, whether that's Duragen or Duracell after doing a decompression that you're worried about? I don't. Yeah, when I repair, I mean, you know, I had probably half a dozen durotomies in my lumbar decompression. So I will use Duragen and Duracell. It depends on where, where the uh, durotomy is and how robust the repair is, but at minimum, they'll get both of those. Oh, oh I, after I, durotomy, I do, yeah. Yeah, after durotomy, oh, I do. I prophylactically. No, uh, probably not. No. Dr. Davis said no, not without a bubble. I think that in the elderly where it's very thin, like if you do a laminectomy, um, I've had a few senior partners recommend just, they call it avatar, but, you know, spraying on the Duragen and they said that they sleep better at night with that, but I don't think there's any science behind it. Probably not. Um, it looks like we have maybe two more minutes. Was there any other comments, questions? I think that... Great job, just from my perspective. First of all, congratulations on a great session. 
I'm trying to take my hand down, I swear. It's not going. Um, but one question that I could ask uh, for discussing, if you had a dural tear and you've repaired it nicely, um, uh, do you want to mobilize the patient afterwards? Or do, you do, uh, do you adhere to the bed for 48, 72 hour magic period? I, if, it, if I'm happy with the repair, it's watertight uh, after Valsava and I think I had a good repair, I let them sit up the next day and walk around uh, and just kind of tell them avoid a coughing, sneezing as much as you can. But yeah, I, the 24 hour thing, I, I, I never really understood what happened after 24 hours. Um, so I haven't done it as, as long as I'm happy with the repair. Yeah, I wait till post-operative day number one, but in the morning I do a head of bed trial and have them out of bed by afternoon. So, you know, if they have any symptoms at 30 degrees, then I'll probably put them back down. And fortunately, for the most part, they uh, can mobilize then. So. I've had a couple I've actually been a little more aggressive with. They were outpatient procedures and I got a watertight seal and I sat them up um, and in the PACU immediately and, and asked them how they felt. At 30 degrees and they said they felt fine and they immobilized and you know i give all my patients my cell phone numbers and i call them post-operatively so i checked on him and we were under the same agreement that if he had a headache he would come back to the hospital and i'd lay him flat or he'd lay flat and we'll deal with it but traditionally i do at jim and uh, chad do and the next morning i sit him up 30 degrees for uh, an hour 90 degrees for an hour and then up ad lib with no headaches um, and Dr. Davis did say that um, several studies have recently showed mobilization is okay. And I think there was one specifically in the yellow journal that showed there was no difference in complication rates with patients who were mobilized or um, before 24 hours and mobilized after 24 hours. So I think it's just basically the conversation you have with the patient, um, which circle back to, you know, Chad's discussion. It's all about communication. So Thank you for our panel and thank you, uh, Dr. Campion for pinch hitting for Dr. Thompson. And we thank everyone who participated in our discussion. And if you would like to continue, um, we will not have another one until January 3rd and I believe they will have a new panel. So thank you guys very much for letting us participate as chairs of the um, Young Surgeon Series in the Seattle Foundation, it's been a great um, experience. And we really do appreciate everyone's um, help and input. Absolutely. It's been a privilege. Thank y'all.